Ladies and gentlemen, Her Excellency the Honourable Margaret Beasley, Governor of New South Wales. Pujiri Gamarua, Dian Babana Gamarada, Gadigal Nara. In greeting you in the language of the Gadigal, the traditional owners of this land where we're gathering tonight, I pay my respects to the elders of the traditional lands across our entire state, past, present, and emerging. I also uh, give, I'm not sure whether it's my apologies or his apologies, uh, that is of Dennis, my husband who is at uh, an event at the uh, Royal Agricultural Society uh, Foundation. And as I was saying in our meeting a moment ago, he'll be talking about uh, cows, and, uh, cows and sheep, you know, the biggest emitter of ethane and the biggest cause of erosion, uh, if we really are concerned about our climate. But we're doing the right thing here at Government House. The Gadigal people, the traditional owners here, their land abuts Sydney Harbour and runs from South Head and extends inland towards what today we call Petersham. Water was and is a primary food source for the traditional owners. There's a campsite which was excavated in 1989 up on Cumberland Street in the Rocks, which has been carbon dated to about 1500 AD, quite recently in Aboriginal history. The meal that day was snapper and rock oysters, some 450 to 500 years before either of those hit the menus of high-class restaurants on Sydney's waterfront. Across from the rocks on Tarpian Way is a monumental sculpture entitled Barra, meaning fishhook. It's in beautiful white marble and it reflects the sheen of the turban shells from which the Aboriginal fisherwomen made their fish hooks. That the waters that they fished in were pristine would be an understatement. Their diet surpassed any Mediterranean, keto, CSIRO, or intermittent fasting diet currently promoted by dietitians and health gurus. But of course, plastics had not been invented at that time. Plastic didn't officially hit the market until 1907, when Leo Bakerland, a Belgian scientist in New York, registered his patent for bakelite, as he called it, one day before Scot the Scottish scientist James Swinburne got to the patent office. Bakelite combined two chemicals, for for formaldehyde and phenol, and it could be said the rest is history. However, it's not bakelite, or only bakelite, which floats around the oceans and waterways of the world. Rather, it is the later and ubiquitous product made of, made of various types of polyethylene, plastic bags, plastic bottles, other plastic containers, co cosmetic scrubs, you name it. There's barely anything that we can put our finger on which is not made of plastic. And they choke our waterways and too frequently become an unwanted food source for marine life and which have created what has been termed the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. In Australia alone, some 130,000 tonnes of plastic finds its way into the marine environment. By 2050, it is estimated that should plastic waste continue to find its way into the ocean at the present rate, then plastic will outweigh fish in our world oceans. It's a sobering thought. For those of you who have not been with us before, uh, including online, I welcome you to Government House. To this, the eighth iteration of Ideas at the House, held in collaboration with the Royal Society of New South Wales, and of which I have the honour of being patron. Ideas of the House was conceived as an idea four years ago with the intention to ignite conversations in the community by exploring important topics. Together here we have, and online, we have canvassed big ideas, including Aristotle on life and thought in the sublunary sphere, 
manufacturing at the uh, atomic scale, music as a superfood, and most recently, the importance of scientific ideas and discovery to Australia's future. And tonight, we continue our journey as a community of scientists, innovators and thinkers with a presentation by Professor Emma Johnston, Ideas for Marine Stewardship and Sustainability in a Time of Acceleration. Now, stewardship requires, it seems to me, knowledge-based understanding and it involves protection of something. Approximately 50% of Australians live within seven kilometres of the coast, a coastline which extends some 34,000 kilometres and includes more than 1,000 estuaries. That brings with it responsibilities, including adherence to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, of which Australia is a signatory. In 2023, Agreement was reached on a high seas treaty to be added as an instrument of the United Nations to the Convention. That places a huge responsibility on us internationally as to the care and uh, looking after our oceans and the environment of our oceans. But of course, responsibility starts at home. We have stewardship of over 16 million square kilometres of ocean, more than twice the area of the Australian continent, where we find thousands, literally thousands of marine species, some of which are unique to Australia and which make us the most biodiversity rich developed country on the planet. And let us ensure that that, we, that will always be so. Last week, the United Nations Educational Scientific, well, UNESCO, I think you know the acronym, gave Australia a one-year reprieve from adding the Great Barrier Reef to the World Heritage in Danger list, with the proviso that we demonstrate next year the protective measures that we are taking. In brief, that clock is ticking. Professor Johnston, Emma, we are so delighted to have you here at the House this evening. I still remember when I first met you at the University of New South Wales when you were Dean of the Faculty of Science. Professor Johnston is just at home on a boat or hanging off a boat in scuba diving gear as she is in university lectures. Professor Johnston is Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research now at the University of Sydney. She is a director of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, probably didn't like that uh, uh, missive from, the, from, the, from UNESCO. You are Governor of the In Potter Foundation and you are the chief co-author of the National State of the Environment Report 2021. In 2018, here at Government House, Professor Johnston was made an officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to higher education, particularly to marine ecology and ex ecotoxiology as an academic, researcher and administrator and to scientific institutes. Among her many awards, she has received the prestigious Royal Society of New South Wales Clark Medal. An inaugural director of the Sydney Harbour Research Program at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science, I'm sure that we all cheered along with her with the recent release into Sydney Harbour of 380 of that endangered white seahorses bred in captivity by the Sydney Institute of Marine Service. Thank you for not only that contribution, for all of those contributions. So who tonight is better to take us on a deep dive into our marine ecology and importantly, because it's added to it, the blue economy. Please welcome Professor Emma Johnston. Thank you, Governor, for that extremely interesting talk as well as a lovely introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here. Thank you everyone for joining us. I know how hard it is to make yourself visit this terrible place. <laughs> no, it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, I do have a talk which is, has got a few ideas in it because that was my brief, present a few ideas. But if there's one thing I've un you know, understood over 30 years of working in coastal and marine ecosystems, in a multidisciplinary world with communities, government, agencies, industry partners and 
colleagues from many different uh, research disciplines is that there's no shortage of ideas. Um, and these are just a few that I throw out. And the power that we have is when we work collectively with these ideas and transform them into action. So um, take it as read that these are a few ideas that should open some conversations uh, between everybody in the audience today and for all of those of you who are joining us on Zoom. I hope you've clicked all the right buttons. So um, I would also like to acknowledge John Turnbull. He's uh, one of my research associates in the research team and who has contributed a great deal to this particular talk that I give this evening, but you'll see that later down the track in relation to the stewardship work. So I begin by also acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, traditional custodians of this land and these seas, the land and sea country and these waters. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves that there are very deep continuing connections to country and I think they're beautifully encapsulated here um, by this mangrove that's weaving itself in between fresh and salt and land and sea and sky. Um, I recognise and honour traditional custodians' deep and continuing connections to country, the deep wisdom that emanates from those connections. I'll also quickly thank some of the many people who have been involved in the research. I'm going to give quite an, quite an overview of some um, broad areas of research and many funders, um, collaborators and particular call out to early career researchers, students, interns, postdoctoral researchers who have contributed their energy, their insights and really led on a lot of this research. It's um, very much a teamwork activity when you're working in environmental science, um, but also particularly in marine and coastal systems where it's almost impossible uh, to get any single data point on your own. And I have to say that the governor suggested I'm at home under sea and on land, but I've got to say it's, I'm much more comfortable on land. Um, and I do acknowledge the great, um, that really tough work that we need to do when we're working in underwater environments, which is partly why we have far less uh, data and a far lower understanding of marine and coastal ecosystems than we have of our terrestrial ecosystems. It's a really <coughs> tough place for humans to work. So, having worked and studied many different forms of human impact in marine and coastal systems, and in fact the one area that I'm not going to talk about was, was introduced by Margaret, so thank you for doing that, was, was the plastics. Um, but I have tended to cover a very large number of different potential activities that humans do that can impact marine and coastal systems. Um, I, I have had time over the years to think about how those human activities and their impacts might work together and compound them. Now, I think it's becoming far more obvious with the climate crisis that we're facing that the world is speeding up. Um, but I also argue, and it's my hypothesis in this talk, that it's not just the heat and the heat stress, but also the impacts of contaminants, biological invasions, disturbance ecology, as well as heat, that all work in the same manner to speed up marine and coastal ecosystems. And this is a conceptual diagram for you to just show that all of the main drivers in our coastal systems, of which I've worked with all of them, all act in various ways to speed up evolution, community dynamics, species interactions, productivity and metabolism. And the result of that combined set of cogs and wheels is a self-reinforcing cycle of weediness where we are constantly resetting the succession of our coastal communities um, through disturbances. We are adding species that have been selected to be weedy, um, highly fecund, growing quickly, reproducing in large numbers, able to dominate ecosystems and, and use up vast amounts of resources. We're adding nutrients, particularly global nutrients around um, the coast and the heat itself is not only creating disturbance but providing a source of increased metabolism, especially in ectothermic uh, communities. So all of this suggests that we would be resetting succession of these communities faster and faster and faster, and that's why it's self-reinforcing. So I'm gonna quickly run through some of the mechanisms that the drivers of this, and then I'll go to some of the consequences 
and some of the potential solutions. So hopefully finishing on a, on a positive note. Am I on the heat slide? I can't. Yes. So at the moment, you'll be aware through the news um, in particular that we are in the middle of a global heat wave. And this is affecting our oceans as much as our, our land environments, arguably much, much more impact in our oceans because the oceans have absorbed 90% of the additional heat that we have produced to date. The oceans are incredibly vast and they're incredibly deep, on average about four kilometres deep. But the heat that has been absorbed um, is coming back and it will come back to bite us. And we are seeing at the moment incredible heat waves um, in parts of the ocean that you can see. I've just downloaded this data you know, a few days ago. And that's the heat anomaly post a post-industrialisation baseline. So the baseline is actually already post-industrialisation and that's the heat anomaly. It's phenomenal. And if you look at 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north, the ocean temperatures are absolutely off the charts. Now, many of you will be familiar with what happens when heat gets to a certain very extreme level, such as we're seeing, and you create heat stress. And this is what results in a disturbance, what an ecologist would call a disturbance, anything that could kill a large number of species in a short period of time. And so the sorts of disturbances that we see on land, such as bushfires, um, droughts, floods, we see marine heat waves and we see very large storms in ocean environments. And particularly in marine heat waves around the coast of Australia over the last decade, it is estimated that 40% of the coastal ecosystems have been subject to a major, like massive ecological disturbance event, 40%. And of course, some of the familiar ones would be the coral reef bleaching, uh, but we also have lost very large areas of kelp forest um, from heat stress, and we've also seen very large areas of mangroves uh, die back based on um, not only heat stress but drought conditions in the Northern Territory. But heat doesn't just act through major stress, major extreme events, it also acts through speeding up ecological dynamics. And it changes the fundamental ecology of ecosystems. And for about 10 years, I have been working with my team from the tropics uh, to the poles. But here in this particular group of studies that we've been doing from Port Douglas down to Bermagui, which is 20 degrees of latitude uh, and 10 degrees of ocean temperature. And we've used a lot of experimental studies, a lot of observational work. And we've been really trying to understand community assembly. What what allows species to coexist? How do they come together? How long do they stay together? And um, we have to look at major processes to understand this, so turnover, growth, um, competitive interactions. And after a lot of research and a lot of experimental studies, we are really understanding more about how these coastal ecosystems might change because there are very different rules from the tropics to the poles, and what we are seeing is the tropics are moving to the poles. So we're using latitudinal gradient as a proxy for understanding climate change uh, effects on ecological systems. And the basics might seem very intuitive to many of you, and I hope it does, that community assembly is fundamentally differing with latitude, in the tropics, we have these rapid community development. It's recruitment driven, it's year round recruitment, high with insight variability. And then as you move to the temperate waters, then you're getting slower community development. It's more deterministic, those systems. And there are consequences for biodiversity. The effective age of communities is reducing, profound implications for coastal ecology and biodiversity. And my short term um, predictions are that temperate and polar ecosystems will actually, on local scales, become more biologically diverse as species move down and it becomes um, a rapid turnover, um, almost tropicalised system, while global biodiversity will be decreasing. So let's move to some examples and um, I'll start with the research in Antarctica that we do under the ice. Um, and this is some of the most extreme field work that my team and I do. Um, this is a very slow moving system. These ecological systems are, you know, I could put down um, a settlement plate in Sydney Harbour and in the middle of summer within a month it would be covered in 
a diverse array of invertebrates and algae. I could do the same thing in Antarctica and come back five years later and only 10% of that settlement plate would be covered with species and they wouldn't be doing much, they'd just be shivering. Um, so it's a really different system. Climate change is affecting Antarctica. Now for many years, and for many years that we've been working there, the circumpolar current surrounding Antarctica has acted as an insulator for the ecological systems down there and for the ice. But very, um, from about 2016 onwards, we have seen quite substantial changes in sea ice cover, which is the ice that forms every year around the continent. Um, and this year we are seeing record lows, and that's what you can see in that red line there in the Antarctic ice extent and ice area. Why is this important? Well, back in um, the early 2000s and published in 2013 in Global Change Biology, we had predicted that there would be substantial consequences of changes to sea ice cover, changes that we had not observed at all in Antarctica, but that we had predicted. So this is... Um, and the annual light reaching the, the polar seas in Antarctica and the Arctic, and how it had changed on the left in the previous uh, 30 years, and what we predicted it would change um, in the coming years. And the consequences of this is actually to speed up ecological systems, because light itself is acting as a resource in these systems. So if you are um, shaded for most of the year by a very large layer of ice that you can see us drilling through and diving under, there is very little light. And you get these very slow communities that are on the, an image on the left of very large, slow-growing invertebrates, sponges as tall as myself, which is very tall, by the way. Um, you know, anem anemones the size of, of big baskets, things that um, have taken a very long time to grow and have not been disturbed for a very long time. Where the sea ice breaks out only a few days earlier, we modelled the light amount that would be available to organisms and predicted that that would um, be enough for algae to outcompete a lot of these invertebrates. So it was based on a lot of survey work, um, but also a lot of modelling and physiology done by other researchers around algal requirements for light. So we stand to lose these beautiful, unique, shallow water invertebrate communities that we have yet to map. So we, because they're under the ice, we have yet to map them around the Antarctic coast. And we do not know if these communities have deep sea refugia species. Um, so we stand to potentially lose those species altogether. Another resource that is regularly added to coastal ecosystems is one I mentioned earlier. So we've talked about heat, we've talked about light. Um, we've talked, to, uh, this is really kind of very familiar nutrients or, or organic enrichment comes via stormwater, sewerage, spills, um, agricultural runoff. But globally, the largest source of this has been the addition of synthetic nitrogen. Fantastic result of incredible experimental research, the Harper-Bosch method. We have capacity to develop and um, create a lot of synthetic nitrogen that has helped us feed the world. Um, but we have applied it liberally, very liberally, and it has washed off into our coasts and oceans. And those nutrients have effectively fertilised our coast and oceans. And just like heat acts as a speeding up mechanism, so do nutrients. But when they become too extreme, then we have stress events or disturbance events. And that's when you get eutrophic conditions low oxygen events, black water events, and we see increasing number of low oxygen events um, causing these disturbances around the globe and low oxygen at deeper, deeper water levels as well. A brand new form of fertilisation of the coasts and oceans has actually resulted from uh, an extreme event that happens on land. In 2019 and 2020, none of us can forget that Australia was subjected to in 2019 to the hottest and driest year on record and at the end of that year we saw extreme bushfires, uh, catastrophic bushfires, simultaneous, um, un previously not observed at, at this scale, intensity or um, synchroni synchronicity. So what happened uh, with my research team, we were working in coasts and estuaries up and down the coast prior to the bushfires and I stood on Coogee Beach 
with the ash washing up around my feet and huge logs washed up on the beach. And I thought, I have never seen this before. This is extraordinary. These, these bushfires must be impacting our coasts and oceans. And there wasn't a single study of that globally, of, of bushfire impacts on coasts and oceans. It had previously been restricted to our waterways and lakes. So I pivoted the research team without any funding on a, on a prayer, uh, wing and a prayer, um, pivoted the team and in between the end of the bushfires, the floods that followed them and the COVID lockdown, they got out there and sampled all of the um, estuarine ecosystems, particularly looking at our soft sedimentary environments where most contaminants, including microplastics, end up concentrating. And um, ash and soil, runs off into the waterways, deposits in these systems. Why bother looking at the mud? Well, this is where we've got extremely high biological diversity, extremely high productivity that feeds the rest of the ecosystem, but also a site of nutrient cycling um, and recycling. So it's essentially where a lot of the cleaning up of our coasts and oceans take place. And so um, finally, actually, the Worldwide Fund for Nature funded this work and they were able to create some agile funding mechanisms that have now been recommended to be established by um, Mary O'Kane's review of the bushfires. So that's a good thing. Um, for this particular extreme event, no funding for research was available until 18 months after the event. Um, so it's too late to detect, but Worldwide Fund for Nature came through. Uh, and supported us. And we have published now the first ever studies of bushfire impacts in estuarine basins. And what we found is really useful, um, that in areas with extreme bushfire where 40 to 90% of the catchment vegetation had burnt, we could see very clear impacts on both the contaminants and the biological diversity where there was no buffer between the burnt and the estuarine edge. Um, or the river edge, but where there was that buffer, we see very little impact, which means that when in our bushfire management and our disaster response plans, if we can prioritise the protection of riparian vegetation, we stand to actually protect these productive ecosystems um, from these extreme events. And just so that you know what all these <laughs> colourful dots are, um, there are a number of, this is a number of the different contaminants, and the interesting bit is the orange and the red, where you see increased pyrogenic carbon, which is a signature of very intensely burnt carbon, um, so the fundamental signature of the bushfires. Totally organic carbon, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, silt and trace metals all increased in the, in the estuarine areas that had no buffer between the burn and the river edge. And essentially that's another fertilisation event. So we can look at the structure of these communities and we now have the first paper out based on our eDNA work. So we use eDNA to look at the structure of these communities. We get approximately 1,400 species coming out um, where previously we would have only identified about 100 in these soft sedimentary ecosystems using these techniques. Um, but we can also look at ecosystem function, which is incredibly important. That's that nutrient cycling and, and recycling. And so we use metatranscriptomics. So we're looking at the gene expression and then we can look at fundamental things like photosynthesis or sulfur metabolism, in this case, um, the nitrogen cycle. And we can see how human impacts change the underlying dynamics of these ecosystems by looking at gene expression. And what we observe when we push these soft sedimentary ecosystems to the edge with fertilisation is um, the disruption to the nitrogen metabolism network. And that's really problematic because it results in the increase in ammonia, nitrite, they're both toxic, hydrogen sulphide, toxic and potentially released into the atmosphere, nit nitrous oxide, which is a highly potent greenhouse gas. And when you think about the entire uh, area of the coastal um, and oceanic soft sedimentary environments, because soft sediments are the dominant habitat, that's an incredibly important area. If we break, if we stop nitrogen cycling in those places, fundamental ecological consequences, but also potentially consequences that need to be built into our climate models. And when we talk about climate forecasting and we understand how we have um, inadvertently under forecast the extreme events, 
It's in part because the capacity to do climate ocean modelling has been limited by computational power um, and, it's, and the downscaling and the incorporation of a whole suite of additional factors is happening now, but it's, it's happening um, in a manner that is, is, able, is enabling us to downscale our predictions, but we may have actually underestimated the impacts in the previous years. So just a final driver of, um, of the speeding up of these ecosystems, and one in which I've spent most of my career working on, which is uh, biological invasions. This is a map of, of shipping across the globe. Humans have been speeding up the rate, rate of transfer of species between continents. About 90% of global trade is by sea. Um, and for any, any one ship, you might have 100 species or so that have managed to attach themselves to some part of the the ship, even with the, the anti-fouling paints, or have got into the ballast water. And these tend to be highly fecund species, um, very invasive, able to take advantage of disturbed ecosystems. And my initial theory that got me my very first discovery grant back in 2004 as an, a, you know, a lecturer at the very early stage was based on the hypothesis that the contamination on the ships would be selecting for highly tolerant contaminant tolerant species, which we were then delivering into highly contaminated ports and harbours, and that that would actually be giving them an advantage over native species. And over about 10 years, I managed to prove myself true, um, correct. So that was, that was good. It kind of culminated in some very large scale studies where we found very clear associations, but there was a lot of experimental work that went behind this, including evolutionary ecotoxicology studies. So this is just a map showing you that as across New South Wales, as contaminants increase along the x-axis of each of these, then you see the mean percent cover and the mean species richness of introduced species going up. You see the opposite or no response of native species and, the, and no response of our cryptogenic species, which the species that we don't yet have a scientific description for. So... Just to sum up this first section of the talk, back to this reinforcing cycle of weediness, hopefully you've understood now how all of those major drivers of coastal ecosystems are working um, in concert. And hopefully you're starting to understand too, in particular if you're not an ecologist by background, how those drivers might be speeding up important drivers of biodiversity, the, the sorts of ways in which community assembly takes place, that species coexist, um, that extinction rates are set, um, and indeed that the very basis of community resilience of ecological systems is underpinned. The consequences of this speeding up of ecological systems, coastal and marine ecosystems, um, is really substantial. Obviously, there is the loss of the inherent biodiversity, which has value itself. But there are also really clear consequences for people. And this is where I start turning to um, human Im the impacts of environment on humans and why we need to be stewards. The consequences for scientists are clear. We need to look at process and function, not just structure, not just worry about who's there, but what those species are doing. Conservation itself has to change. We'll, we will need to move to... Um, using more temporal mechanisms of protection as well as spatial. We will need to look at intervention in ecological systems, marine and coastal ecological systems, for example, weeding them or seed, seeding them. Um, these sorts of biological interventions will be necessary for protecting biodiversity. Um, and also the way in which we use these ecosystems, the way in which we harvest species that we were talking about earlier, um, needs to change. We need to eat down the food chain because there's not going to be much left up the food chain. Um, so a range of different consequences that we need to take uh, on board and adapt our mechanisms. So how do we get from here to there? How do we change the way that we use ecosystems? And this is where in particular John Turnbull's work that he's um, been doing with us over the last 10 years or so um, is really important because it's about converting vicious cycles to virtuous cycles. It's not just the energy transition that is required here, it's a biodiversity transition, it's a societal transition. Um, and it's about transforming through an understanding, an evidence-based understanding of socio-ecological systems. 
So an example of a virtuous cycle is where there are increased ecosystem values that support more sustainable management, that pr help protect ecosystems, that create more big fish and you know, fish larvae that spin out of those marine parks, for example, that increase the diversity and abundance of marine life that therefore then increase people's values and, and their willingness to conserve. That's an example of a virtuous circle. And it comes and it hits really hard at the unsustainable nature of much of our work at the moment. And the SDGs are a particularly good lens to look at this for on. So this report shows that we are making across the globe progress on a couple of SDGs, very important ones, you know, under five mortality, neonatal mortality, uh, access to primary education, excellent. Um, some progress on a lot of the other goals. But if you look at the actual environmental or biodiversity related goals, climate, life on oceans, life on lands, we're going backwards. And that is the very definition of unsustainable. unsustainable. We have um, been living beyond our means and the social values that have um, increased and the social benefits have been at the direct cost of environments. And you can see that where you see the most advanced countries have actually the best social thresholds achieved, but the most biophysical boundaries transgressed. Um, how do we turn this around? It's not impossible. In fact, some would argue it could be quite easy because our coastal users already report very strong stewardship in Australia. And this is work based on surveys of hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands, around most of the coast from Sydney to Western Australia, including Tasmania. Many of these coastal users, and this is the first uh, study quantifying local coastal stewardship, um, rather than just a qualitative assessment. So we've both got the qualitative and the quantitative coming in here. 80% or more report doing at least one or two um, stewardship actions on their coast. And some of our Uber stewards are doing five or more of the stewardship categories. And that's because they really value coastal ecosystems. But we found the greatest environmental improvements came when local stewardship actions of our community users were combined with or supported by institutional steward and stewardship. And this is really the self-reinforcing positive virtuous cycle that we've um, identified and mapped. So in areas where um, there is high institutional protection of environments and good social management and um, policy management, that provides institutional stewardship for the place. It provides an op opportunity for local stewardship and it increases the biodiversity and the ecosystem service values of that ecosystem, which then feed back positively to support people and policy. So it's people, policy and place. It, it comes, it creates a positive cycle. It avoids the tragedy of the commons or direct exploitation. And this map on the right just shows that as we mapped at any one site maximum local stewardship, we actually found that it correlated with positive biodiversity um, records such as the number of big fish. Conversely, where we don't have a good alignment between policy and, um, and values and stewardship, we get um, potentially a lot of resources wasted on ineffective uh, protection measures. And this is a study where we've compared partially protected marine coastal areas with fully protected areas and completely open um, exploitable areas. And in fully protected areas, we see not only diversity and biomass, for example, being positively correlated with being fully protected, as you would expect, and as there are thousands and thousands of studies showing, but you also, for the first time we map the social values, you see very positive attraction, um, positivity, people are optimistic about their area, they are understanding the protection, they're doing stewardship actions within those areas. Conversely, when you look at partially protected areas, compared to fully open areas, there's no biological difference in terms of positive biological differences, a few um, negative impacts that we saw, but also there's no social values that are being recognised by those systems. People are confused, they don't know if it's protected, they're not more optimistic about that area and they don't care more about it. Um, so I think it, it's very strong evidence 
that having this alignment, especially at local, scale, local scales, will support biodiversity resilience, but it will also support more stewardship and more um, social values being recognised and met. I'm confident this happens at a global scale as well. We can look at things like the Montreal Protocol. We can look at um, remote area values. We can look at uh, the Global Biodiversity Framework, for example, which is a global agreement to protect 30% of land and seas by 2030. When people feel that everybody is chipping in to protect biodiversity, when people feel that everybody is making that energy transition, um, they are more likely to give up some of their own uh, benefits that they have got from those systems. But we've got a long way to go. In Australia alone, just talking about the, um, the marine global biodiversity framework, we need to move from 10% fully protected to 30% fully protected in seven years' time. And that's going to take a lot of political and public will. I'm going to end, hopefully I've got a moment to end, on the final example, which is a, an approach, a new approach taken in the State of Environment report. So I was one of three chief authors. Um, I recognise and acknowledge Ian Cresswell and Terry Janke, my co-chief authors, uh, but there were also 32 other authors of the State of Environment report. Um, this is an example where we changed the reporting to include well-being um, and Indigenous authorship and it substantially changed the way in which people are connecting with the State of Environment report and understanding their connection to environments. This is the basic reporting requirements. Every five years it's legislated. The, the Minister has to release it within 15 sitting days of receiving the report. Um, so what's changed? Well, just the title itself um, and, the, and the message underneath, our future well-being and prosperity depend on making a difference and healing country. That is quite a different style of messaging. It connects people to country. It connects people to, um, to the environment. And this is very deliberate. It was the first report to be co-authored by Indigenous authors and environmental scientists together. It is the first to include a chapter on extreme events, the first to link to the United Nations SDGs and the first to develop wellbeing assessments. So if you haven't delved into the report, it's all online, I encourage you to read it. Um, it's very long, so maybe dip in and out when you need, <laughs> when you need to. These are the different chapters just so that you can see um, the, the range of environments that we look at the state of and the threats to and the trajectory of and the management of. Um, but see highlighted extreme events and a whole um, chapter authored entirely by Indigenous authors. Terry Janke led the Indigenous Perspectives chapter um, and Indigenous Perspectives are integrated throughout the entire report. Uh, they used yarning circles, they used case studies, and we deliberately um, interwove the stories so that you can recognise the scientific um, expertise and you can recognise the Indigenous expertise, but we haven't segregated them. Um, we did that through a set of collaboration guidelines and very respectful interactions between all of the authors. And it was really um, very innovative and something very new. <coughs> but we were building on a long tradition that has um, gone before us, sorry, a short tradition, but we were inspired by it, um, of working together. And I just wanted to acknowledge the Strong People, Strong Country framework, uh, which is a, a product of these authors, um, hosted by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, as biased as I am. I, do, um, I am very proud of the approach that the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has taken over the years to Indigenous co-management um, and to stewardship. And I think it's a great example where uh, traditional use of marine resource agreements are community-based plans, they're co-developed um, and they're for the traditional resources and it's accredited by legislation. So it's a classic example of where we've got people, policy and place connected through these um, these agreements and it now covers, it's actually just hit above 50% of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park coastline. We also have schools um, who are guardian schools, we have guardian councils, we have master reef guides, we have advisory scientific committees. Um, it is a very community-based marine park management and 30% of the Great Barrier Reef is actually fully protected from all exploitation. Um, as you will have heard last week, and the Governor mentioned, it is still highly threatened. 
Um, and that's because the number one threat to the reef is climate change and the second threat is uh, poor water quality, both of which are um, substantially still impacting those ecosystems and threatening to increase them to a greater extent. So we're not out of the woods, but we do have really quite substantial stewardship models. People care about them. We also have global community of stewards that care about the Great Barrier Reef, and I think that is a very important thing that is driving um, some of the change we see in environmental legislation and environmental protection in Australia. Um, final aspect is the link to wellbeing. So as a state of environment report usually only reports on biophysical conditions, we introduced wellbeing assessments and we asked, we challenged all of our authors to develop human wellbeing assessments. This is the definition of wellbeing that we adopted, which is quite broad. These are some of the assessments that we created um, and it was quite tricky. We only developed seven uh, wellbeing assessments, but there were many more case studies and, and narratives that will develop into assessments in future reports. The main reason for doing this is to help people understand how fundamentally we are reliant on biodiversity and environmental conditions. And we came up with key priorities for ocean stewardship. These will involve Indigenous people, community groups, individual scientists, investors, industries and governments, everybody working together. Um, and I think it has engendered a lot of conversations in industry and in community groups and in schools and in high schools and in universities. And I hope that, that it engenders a lot more um, both legislative change, policy change, practice and community engagement. The crux of the problem that we are facing at the moment is something I mentioned earlier. We have a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis and a historical legacy of human impacts in marine and coastal systems. We are now faced with a very rapid transition, energy transition across the globe. And the potential is there for us to do it very, very poorly because the time that we have is very short. If we don't work together with communities and industries and people who have a biodiversity focus as well as the engineers that are required, then um, we, we stand to lose a lot of biodiversity through the energy transition. It doesn't have to be like that. And there are many, many win-wins if we um, focus on these for the climate biodiversity twin crisis. So I'm gonna leave you with these ideas. Nature-based carbon stores, not a, not a new one, but a very important one. Protecting places of potential climate refuge not something that a lot of people are talking about, but very, very important about where we put our protective areas. Restoring in advance, again, not a conversation that many people are having yet, but very important. So using ecological, ecological forecasting, like we can, we can do on the basis of our studies that have gone from Bermagui up to Townsville, predicting in advance which species will be able to survive the new conditions. And when we do restoration projects, deliberately restoring those species that are adapted to the new conditions rather than trying to recreate the old. Disaster response plans that are biodiversity positive. Some of these might be how we protect riparian vegetation, as I've mentioned earlier, but there are many, many ways that we could be um, cognizant of biodiversity impacts while we support communities to thrive through um, what we know are going to be an increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters. Improving habitat connectivity so that species can move to fit their new environments and deliberately translocating species through assisted species migration. One of the disastrous situations we face is if only some species move south and the rest of that community doesn't because then we essentially have an invasive species situation. Um, so for example, the herb if the herbivorous fish um, move south from the tropics and the coral reefs as they are, we may lose our kelp forests. If the herbivorous fish and the coral reef move south as well, we have a more intact functioning ecosystem. It sounds bizarre to be talking like this, but it's important for us to have these conversations. The transition to um, renewable energy must consider biodiversity positive approaches and there are several available. Finally, and probably most controversially at the moment, is starting these conversations around negative emissions technologies. 
Um, it, is been a no -go, it has been a no-go zone for many people to consider that we may need to use quite substantial te new technologies um, involving potentially some geoengineering. It is a very difficult topic, but we have the choice of having those conversations openly and including our communities, especially our traditional owners, in those conversations about how we might need to use negative emissions technologies or not having those conversations and having those technologies introduced anyway without the social licence and without the social engagement and without the social justice required to understand and work with them. Um, so I suggest that now is the time to have those conversations before those inevitable technologies are rolled out. I'm going to end there with a positive note <laughs> and a flying whale. Um, hold on to your hopes, my friends. We're in for a wild ride. Um, but we do have the option of doing this together or fighting our way through. And I strongly recommend that the proven evidence-based approaches to better options for social and ecological systems is through understanding them deeply, but bringing them together and as stewards of our environment, working together to make a positive impact um, through our research, supporting local and institutional stewardship and creating sustainable policies and practices. Thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic, Emma, and uh, my name is Susan Pond, President of the Royal Society of New South Wales. Congratulations on your presentation. I add to the long list of credentials that Her Excellency read out that you are a Fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales, as well as the right. Academy of Science and the Academy of Technology and Engineering. I had two curly questions, but I'm going to hand the floor over to the university students and the teachers in the audience to ask the first questions. So could I have someone? Oh, this is the tough, this is the tough part of the night. Thank you. Oh, hello, well, John Rose my name, Gordon's Bay Scuba Diving Club and a very humble member of the Royal Society. Good to Thank see you, Emma, I've admired you for years. But uh, I was just wondering where ocean acidification fits in in the whole process. To me, that's the most frightening thing of all with increased carbon dioxide. And we lose all carbonate systems uh, if, you know, our pH drops from 8.2 to 7.8, I think it is. Yeah, look, um, really important and another driver of, of global change in oceans. And we are seeing already decreased calcification rates in coral reef systems um, and obviously changes to phytoplankton communities in um, ocean systems. I think um, it's, it's one of those impacts that hasn't, it got a, originally it got a, quite a lot of attention, but it's kind of paled into significance because people are focused on the extreme events and those mass mortality events, whereas with the ocean acidification, it's what we call a chronic um, change. You know, it's a chronic average change to ocean acidification that's going to have substantial impacts across all ecological systems. Um, it's particularly problematic in colder waters uh, and where it's already harder for organisms to calcify. So the first impacts we, would, we are seeing and expect to see in southern oceans as well. Yeah. I think there's also an expert in the room, Martina Doblin, who could probably answer that question better than I could if you need to, um, Director of the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Yeah. One of the university students, somebody stand up with a question. Great. Um, hi, my name's Nuseba Skendri. I'm a data engineering student from UTS. So as part of my studies include AI, which is very, you know, a very trendy buzzword at the moment. I do wonder where you see that, you know, where we, you see um, you leveraging that technology in these studies, particularly um, to broach these areas where humans can't access and, you know, obviously lead to better outcomes in these areas, particularly now that we have so much data that we can leverage and teach these algorithms to learn and actually be able to forecast, as you said, um, you know, these areas that need restoration before these events actually happen. Thanks, great question. I'm just going to type that into chat GPT and get the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's fantastic. I mean, the, 
you know, researchers have been using AI for, for many years and um, generative AI is, is another form and it's a, it's a game changer as well. So that's exciting for researchers. Um, there are a few key issues that we have to um, be very, very careful about. Attribution, um, being able to trace the pathways of knowledge development and also not accelerating or, or um, compounding potential biases that occur in the underlying data sets that are used um, in generative AI. So I think that's my cautionary note. And this is my D DVCR hat on. Um, with my uh, ecological science hat on, I would say that we're, it's another advance that could substantially enhance our capacity to do the kind of global climate models that we need to do, but also to do the ecological forecasting. So. Um, particularly in, in marine and coastal systems because they are so hard to access. Um, you, even today, from when I began research where I might spend, for example, an hour with a paperboard clip with my underwater plastic paper, um, people didn't know that existed, did it, but it does, and my underwater pen, which is a pencil, um, and, you know, writing you know, what I saw for an hour and I might get a 50 metre transect done and be freezing cold. Um, you know, only if about five to 10 years ago, we started using underwater cameras that were GPS tracking using underwater scooters like James Bond. And, you know, we could do one kilometre transect in an hour. And, and now really you can use remotely operated vehicles themselves. And you can also use um, ships with underwater cameras. You can use acoustic backscattering, like, the number of technologies that have advanced, people put down GoPros and, and watch animal behaviour in a way that's never been done before. The molecular technology techniques are opening up entire worlds of biodiversity that we could never look at before. The microbes, the viruses, you know, the archaeobacteria. So in terms of the visibility that we have of ecological systems under the ocean, it's been just wonderful the advances that have been made that requires very high performance computing, that requires fantastic um, data scientists and AI specialists. It also requires um, integration of data sets in a way that hasn't been, that for example, Geosciences Australia have been working very well with on the data cube. But I am very excited to see that the federal government has just announced their new environmental data commissioner. I can't remember the exact title, but that is expressly in response to um, data requirements for understanding ecosystems better and a commitment from the Commonwealth Government to, in response to the State of Environment report, but also in response to the Samuels review, of actually getting our act together on collecting that nation, national wide data set so we can better understand and, and manage them. So I think it is extremely exciting and it's a positive note um, in a dire circumstance. Yeah. One more question. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Emily Hinder from the University of Wollongong studying um, a double degree science and law. And I come from a particularly regional area where agriculture is a primary industry for us and making specific reference to the excess nitrogen in the ocean. Obviously, that's... Um, something for that's used quite a lot in agriculture. How would you suggest that regional communities can balance the needs for primary industry and also for food production? How would you say that we can balance that with the needs of the ocean, with the excess nitrogen that's obviously being such an issue? Yeah, great question. I mean, there's some obvious um, actions that are well known and well tried. And, um, you know, for example, restoring and protecting riparian vegetation around your waterways, um, preventing access of large herbivore, hoofed herbivores from those waterways so that you're actually not getting that damage from the cows and the sheep coming down and, and drinking the water around those places. Um, so there's those sorts of mechanisms. There's the timing of application, which is assisted, the timing of fertiliser application, which is assisted by these large data sets and a better understanding of climate and, and local um, weather conditions. There are new soil um, science technologies, so particularly at the University of Sydney, we have some of the best soil scientists in the world, and understanding at a nanoscale how soil 
acts and how it retains nutrients and lets those nutrients go um, has the potential to substantially reduce the need to use artificial or synthetic fertilisers. And then I think finally there's generative, uh, regenerative agricultural approaches where we don't go for the great monoscale, um, you know, kind of like completely monocultural agricultural activities, but we go for multi species systems. Um, that's a much more expensive way to do agriculture. So we need to balance that with the need to feed the world, um, but it's also a more sustainable model. And so if we value the true cost of those ecological systems against what we need to pay for food and we can find an equitable way of doing it, then I think those very substantial regenerative approaches to agriculture can be highly beneficial. Well, we need to close because we're going out to the veranda for the informal conversation. I'll thank you very briefly by saying that you are another star in the ideas of the house firmament, Emma. Thank you very much, Susan. Yeah. Uh, our last two ideas of the house have been presented by a uh, scientist, uh, Kathy Foley, and, and Emma, you'll be interested to know that the next one is on the 6th of March next year and it will be presented by John Bell of Bell Shakespeare. Oh, I hope to see many of you there. <laughs> we are a diverse society that spans the sciences and humanities and it's fascinating to hear the various stars in our Ideas of the House Club mm. present. So thank you very much, Emma, for coming tonight and speaking so eloquently and forcefully and also optimistically. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And happy. So, Your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to follow on from Susan's uh, vote of thanks to our speaker tonight, can I also uh, thank you all, the members of the Royal Society and friends of the Royal Society and other friends of Government House for attending tonight and also to those in our online audience as, as well. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone, including those in our online audience, uh, to come back to Government House. One of the best kept secrets in New South Wales is that uh, we're the only Government House in the country open to the public for free guided tours every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And on the first of the, the month, first Sunday of the month, I meant to say, we have jazz at the house. Uh, so you can bring, we have got then open house tours, and you can bring your picnic basket and enjoy jazz performances uh, from the wonderful jazz uh, uh, sextets, quintets from our various uh, service uh, bands. Even to our online audience, if you want to uh, uh, go to our website, our Government House website, and you can't get here, there's a virtual tour of the house on our website, which won a prize in an international contest for, uh, for virtual tours. So we're very proud of that. Uh, so I'd encourage, encourage you all to have a look at that. So again, we'd love to see you back here at Government House for one of, on one of those days, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and the first Sunday of the month. So we'll say goodbye now to our online audience uh, and thank you for your attendance. <laughs>